Film Tech Podcast for Friday, July 29th from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. From Powell, Ohio, I'm TJ Huddleston. And from Pickering, Ontario, I'm Gavin Campbell. And welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast all about, about automation, home technology, and, and disease, sickness. I guess you can tell which one of us is sick. To, actually, there's there's two thirds of the show is, is sick tonight. So, um, Gavin, uh, you're doing all the talking tonight. I'm 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 calling it a day before I hack up a lung on the air here. That that would not be good. But uh, yeah, yeah, I I got sick. Let's see, last Thursday, I woke up and I'm like sore throat. Don't feel good. Oh no, I've got the COVID. And I took a bunch of tests. No COVID yet. So still haven't gotten that. Um, TJ, what about you? Man, I uh, last week I had you know I had a residual like sore throat all throughout the week, and I kind of feel sick whenever temperature changes quite a bit. You know, if, if I'm going in from uh, you know very hot outside to AC inside all the time, I kind of get sick all the time when that happens. Um, so I had a rough throat last week, and then Thursday after I did a couple jobs, I just I felt like death. I did not want to move. Like my body, just my whole body was just in pain. Um, and, uh, you know, went and got a COVID test on Saturday and they confirmed that we actually do had COVID, uh, on Sunday. Um, so yeah, not a, not a good run there for the whole week. Oh man, no good, no good. And so that like takes you out. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're self-employed. So it's like the worst of the worst. You can't just be like, yeah, I'm taking a sick day. Nope. Nope. You don't get a sick day. Yeah, luckily, uh, luckily, I had two days of tra- online training this week uh, for Thursday and Friday. So um, my week was kind of already shot anyway, um, but it did throw all my other plans into the uh, into the wash. So we'll have to get everything rescheduled and put me further behind schedule. But it is what it is. Well, if it makes you feel better, TJ, you sound great. You sound great. Seth, uh, this is going to be a rough show. <laughs> rough. Yeah, yeah, I would think that Seth has COVID yeah, the way exactly. he's reacting. So. I- I don't know. Took a took a ton of tests. Like uh, I think I was on my fourth test. And my wife was like, "Why do you keep taking those? It's not going to change." I'm like, "It might. It might change." But yeah, I I I um I lost my voice Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a little bit back on Monday, and then today is today, so Tuesday. Um, uh, this is the first day I've actually had a voice, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see if it can make it through the show. <laughs> but um, we got a little bit of follow up this week. Um. I guess uh, COVID's back, obviously. Uh, disease and sickness is back. Uh, but I guess what else is back, guys? Wink. What? Yeah, kinda, kinda. Um, so I checked on the show. I was like laughing as we I, as I edited the show yeah, while I was sick on it was like Saturday, I think, because I couldn't move Friday. Um, but I was like looking at the uh, the status page, status dot wink dot app, uh, status wink app dot com. I think is what it is. Yeah, status dot wink app dot com. And uh, it, it was all red still. And I'm like, oh, they, they haven't fixed this thing. It's, the show's going out. That's really funny. And I guess um, today or yesterday, uh, real late, 8 o'clock at night, uh, they pushed out a fix. Actually, 8 o'clock UTC. So what would that be? Yeah, it's pretty late at night here too. Um, they, they, they said a fix has been implemented and we're monitoring the results. But everything is still like degraded performance according to their little status page here. Uh, and I saw in the tweet that they said that don't trust it until don't don't call us we'll call you but basically don't worry about anything until uh the the thing says resolved on this page and so you know it took a month basically 25 days for us to get to degraded performance like how how long is it gonna be until we we see resolve on this on this chart here just put it out of its misery just shut it down nobody else is who's using this at this point right like because insteon had such a loyal fan base but I feel like Wink fan base has been shrinking for the past several years anyway. That there, I don't know who's left. I don't even. Does anybody really care other than us at this point? Like, I, I think a lot of Wink users have moved on by now. Uh, looking at the forums for you know smart things for Habitat, you know, there's a lot of people on there that just came from Wink and they're already migrating over and they're like, we're done with Wink. And I think this is like what the second outage recently with Wink. So I think. People are just fed up. They're moving on. That's it. We're done. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure who um, who still uses it, but it, it's definitely definitely interesting. I think is it our Wink Hub. I think is on, on Reddit, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. People are posting in here. I'm leaving. They're back, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> we made up. We're back together. <laughs> the, the glass door review. Wow. Glass door reviews reveal even more employees are not getting paid. So yeah, not, not a good situation. Oh man. That's not good. When that, when that's happening, that's, that's not good at all. So. All right. Well, I'll get the, uh, the GoFundMe started. We'll, uh, see if we can purchase <laughs> wink. We'll get right on that hundred thousand dollar mark for our Patreon. <laughs> I think we can go less now. <laughs> Yeah, wait a little, a little, a little bit longer. We'll be able to go even way, way less. I gotta than say, the, I mean, Wink, Wink was pretty iconic. I, I remember that that robot, the robot thing. You guys remember the robot? Uh, the, the it was like inappropriate robot or something like that. That was like polishing a cactus while he was sitting there watching the woman do yoga. Oh, that commercial. I have no idea what you're talking. about. Oh my about. god, it's a great commercial. I, I'll have to post it in our show notes. But um, it, it's it's like a perverted robot. I think is what we called it on the show. And uh, it was there. It was actual commercial. It was out on TV and everything. It was on YouTube and TV. I saw it on TV. I was like, "What? What is this? This is insane!" So, uh, good go in there back when they had money and you know were popular. But now, not not so much, unfortunately. Um, it 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 seems like this one's headed towards the graveyard. But we'll have to see if if they're still getting five bucks a month from patient people who will wait a month before their home automation works again. Uh, let's see how long that lasts. Let's move on. All right, another bit of follow up I wanted to cover tonight uh, before we move on. Uh, Gavin, uh, I think you posted this that that uh, you've got these new Aqua Aqua Acara Acara sorry Acara E1 blinds. I guess somebody posted in Reddit as well that if you blocked China from uh, from your from your router, so where your your devices in the house can't see China um, servers, that that's your Acara system stopped working. Is, is that, is that the case? What's going, what's going on with this? So to clarify this, this is with the iOS app and the Aquara hub, right? So if you block China, um, the blinds stopped working when they were added to the Aquara hub. Um, those devices have Zigbee built into them. So I add them to my hub, hub directly. So they still work because that's all local. But if you're using the Aquara hub, um, yeah, things seem to stop working if you block China. Now, there was a representative uh, from Aquara replying to this Reddit th thread saying, this is interesting. It's obviously not supposed to do that, but we need help finding other sites that may cause maybe going to China. Because I guess when you choose, when you configure in the app, you choose the US, then nothing should be going to China. But they obviously, they said that, you know, there, there are obviously some things in there that they did not find or they missed and they need to just find it. So they're asking for people's help, which is good that they're trying to, you know, not make things go to China, but also bad the fact that they have to ask our help to find this. So it's a funny thread to watch because, of course, you know, on Reddit, they're getting bashed. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can understand a little bit of this, of how how this kind of works <laughs> when you develop product that that has Chinese developers <laughs> involved. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 they tend to get stuff working just so, and, and that's good enough. And there it is, but they don't, the intricacy doesn't seem to, unless it's explicitly spelled out and, and you check, double check every single time, they'll just overwrite a mistake and, and say, well, you know, it's back. I, sorry. I, I put the old Chinese servers back in cause that's what it works at my house. Um, but yeah, uh, at Andrew from Aquara here, uh, I guess he's a company rep said, no, we have local servers on the markets where we are present officially. Our goal is to not let our global devices connect to Chinese servers, and we'll check this carefully uh, and release a, a solution ASAP if it's happening. So that, that's good. Uh, it, it's responsive. Um, ho hopefully they can push that up to their developers and get them to release the firmware that gets pushed back down. And in that case, I kind of they kind of gets hounded in here by a couple of other people. Uh, and says, and no, nah, unfortunately, bugs happen sometimes. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> believe me, yeah, I've been they're giving him a hard time on, yeah. <laughs> on Reddit, you know, like poor guy. Yeah, I, I've been working on a, a, a bug for four weeks now. Oh, longer than that, actually, uh, from some firmware of a device that we picked in. And all like we approved the device and they shipped it over and they shipped like, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them, right? We get them, look at it, test it, perfect. Looks good, works perfect. Has our logo exactly where it's supposed to be. And then um, I'm visiting the office. I know it was a couple months ago, I guess now. I was visiting the office. I plugged one of them in to test while I was there. And I loaded it up. And it was like, no. like the, the Basically, they had not included a style sheet that I included with the changes, you know, to, to, to cover the HTML web interface. And I'm like, uh, no, this isn't right. And our logo, is mis our logo has like the wrong file name and, you know, a couple of other things. I was like, this just is not what we approved. And so like, oh, we'll send it back. We'll send you a new one back over. 
yeah, back and forth, back and forth. Basically, the firmware they sent back doesn't work at all. So <laughs> it's, it's like we either get a janky looking box, you know, with, with this broken interface or we just get a broken box. You know, which one do you want? And uh, yeah, that's that's China. So I feel for these guys. I understand how it works. We did luckily find a workaround. Uh, not, not, I'm not happy about it, but we found a workaround. So um, yeah. Yay, yay, yay. And uh, last piece of follow-up here, uh, you also posted about needing to register for Zoo's firmware updates. Uh, sounds like Zoo's is, actually, I like this. Like, it sounds like they're forcing people to register so they can say, hey, there's a problem or you may need to update for this or, you know, is, is that the idea? Is that what they're trying to do? So, you know, this comes off the hype of uh, Linus Tech Tips, uh, you know, his video about firmware. And I guess oh. Zoo's posted on Twitter saying, hey, we now you know, uh, have our firmware, you know, available for you to download and stuff. Right. So I saw that on Twitter. So I was like, okay, let me go and register. So I had to register and it basically asks you all the products you have. And I'm a big Zeus fan. So I had a lot. Right. And that was great. And then it's like, oh, now you got to register for our support. And I'm like, oh, I got to register again, another password, another username. So I finally registered for that. So then I finally got access to all their support and the first thing I did is I started looking up uh, the firmware, latest firmware for the power strip that I just got because I just got their latest power strip. And man, that article hurt. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to blame Zeus because firmware is hard and there's many factors to this, but it's a mess, especially in the Z-Wave space. So like there's hardware revisions, right? So my power strip is version 3.0 of that hardware, right? Like they all look the same, but mine's version 3.0. But then there's also different software versions based on the hardware revisions. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, which firmware am I supposed to have, you know? And based on the hub, not every hub's gonna display the firmware driver uh, version. Not every driver is gonna display the firmware version. So they, it's a support nightmare for them. Right. Just to try and figure out from a user's point of view, just to try and figure out what hardware version you have and what firmware version of that you have is going to be so difficult, um, you know, but at least they're putting effort in. And that's what I appreciate. So I was able to get my hardware version, my software version, verify I had the latest one. But, you know, even looking at the release notes the, you know, whenever they release a new firmware version, if they make tweaks to a parameter, they add new parameters, take away parameters, change the parameters. That requires driver updates on all the various hubs for those Z-Wave drivers, right? It's a lot of work. To take advantage of the new features, right? right? Yeah. yeah, or even if they changed it. Like, I've seen some additions where they changed um, the Fahrenheit to Celsius, you know, and the temperature things. Now, that requires everybody to go into their drivers, and then they have to modify the drivers, say, if you're on this firmware, then use this. And if you're on this firmware, then do it this way. You know, from a developer point of view, it's difficult and it's tough. So... Uh, you know, in as a whole, the industry just needs to figure out a way to do firmware right. You know, just an easy way. And I think um, Home Assistant is probably gonna lead that race. It sounds like they have a plan, a, a way to do this. They'll scan your system, gather the information, know what firmware to apply to it, and just do the update. Right. The whole update process itself is a whole different story. That's a pain in the ass to do too. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, this is kind of mostly on the DIY side, but um, yeah, I don't know. It could, it could it could come to the uh, the the uh, the pro side or the prosumer side uh, one day. No, nothing really stops these companies from doing it. It's it's just a business logic or whatever. So it's interesting. This is this is why nobody just does firmware updates. Everybody just ignores them at this point. So <laughs> and, and for the most part, like it's not really for security. Firmware updates is usually to fix bugs or to you know add new features or take away features. So if your device works, just leave it. Don't even worry about the firmware. Just you know leave it as it is, unless there's some reason you have to upgrade the firmware. Ty saying it, it takes one well-known YouTuber to get companies making uh, making steps towards the right way. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we've been complaining about this for a long time. I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> so, we're not famous YouTubers, though. We're not famous YouTubers. Yeah, I guess we should start doing the YouTube show more often. But uh, there we are. Um, if you're in the hub, you usually get a, a you know a link whenever we record on Tuesdays. So yeah, uh, I guess we could do better with that. We're YouTubers. We're just not famous. That's right. Yeah, we're just to totally not famous. <laughs> no, but it, it's it's good to it's good to see companies starting to do this. 
Um, I'm hoping that Matter will make software updates easier because just like you've described, Gavin, the updating for firmware for Z-Wave devices is completely awful. Like there's not an easy way to do it. It sometimes takes forever or it fails multiple times. Um, there's not a clear and concise area you can go to get firmware updates for a lot of companies. Um, so I, I'm glad we're starting to see this and maybe it'll make firmware updates for a lot of these devices easier in the future. And something that, you know, you kind of check for immediately when you when you get one of these devices. And keep in mind, Z-Wave has multiple frequencies based on country, right? So even with their firmwares, they have you have to know what country the person's in, you know, which firmware file. So that was the whole point of registering is that at that point, they knew what country you're in, what devices you have, what to offer you in terms of support. And it helps them. Um, you're now on their mailing list when they have a new firmware that fixes something that's important. They can they know how to get a hold of you. So that's that's a good reason to register if you're a Zoo's uh, user. Yep, I agree. I agree. Well, all, all good things, hopefully, if you can get those firmware updates done. But guys, what do you say we jump into some Hub and Tech headlines? Let's, Let's do, it. do it. So um, have you guys ever thought to yourself, smart home automation is really hard to do without advertisements for like apps and skills uh, from third party developers? Yeah, all the time. Well, you're in luck. Um, because Amazon announced this week that they're going to be offering new pop-up ads uh, on your favorite Echo Show devices. That's great, huh? Um, it's going to promote software from developers, uh, products you might like or not even know of. Uh, paid promotions are, quote, something that developers have asked us for, said Aaron uh, Rubinson, uh, an Amazon VP who leads teams working on developer tools. Uh, there are times when developers really want to drive outsized attention to their skill. So there you go. Ads, more ads <laughs> coming, coming to everyone's chatty little advertisement cube box thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. This, this doesn't appeal to me at all. It's kind of one of the reasons I just have no desire to turn back on the the uh, the tube thing and, and, and just leave it sitting over there in the in the bin. And I know it's not going to go on the on the on the in the graveyard anytime soon, but I have no no desire to use Amazon's products uh, because every time I'm near somebody who's using them, it's always like, Hey, did you know that you can? And it's like, da, 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 da. it's like, no. Yeah. See, I, I don't know why everybody wants to do that. Like my Sonos devices do that now. And then my Google assistant do that as well, where it's like, Hey, you know, you don't have to do this or, Hey, you could do this. And it's like, I don't care. Just do what I asked and, and stop. I don't need the little tips throughout. I don't need like little reminders of what else I can do. Just, I just want to talk to you and have you do things. And that's it. Did you know S S Siri won't even tell you anything? <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't work at all. Yeah. I can't even get mine to work on my phone half the time. So I, I feel sorry for anyone named Alexa right now, because they're probably becoming the most hated person in the world right <laughs> now. You know, like it, it's, it's, I, I'm getting used to like ignoring ads, but then it's just be, what drives me nuts is those ads that are getting more and more intrusive, right? So when you're watching a YouTube video and then right at the good spot, you have to watch two minutes of like a, a, some ad that has nothing to do with what I care about or the video, you know, right in the middle of everything. I hate that. Right. Well, I mean, when you you just need to answer the YouTube surveys every time, and and the way well, you can actually tailor. Your or you ads. pay yeah. for YouTube? What is like it? What is it? Yeah, YouTube, YouTube Red, Premium. Yeah. YouTube Premium. You yeah, know, yeah. But yeah. ads, I worth it. You know, on the Echo Show, if they're gonna pop up on the screen when you're not looking at it, I'm fine with that because we're not gonna see it. But if, if you're gonna be doing something, you're try, like trying to disable an alarm or something like that. But an ad pops up 15 seconds right when you're trying to disable your alarm and you only have 30 seconds to do it, that's not going to be, people are not going to be happy about that, you know, or you're trying to talk to somebody in your front door and an ad pops up. No, you're not, you're not like, I, they, they need to do it right if they're going to do it. And I don't know, hopefully they do it right. Yeah, I don't know. Amazon said there's about 13, uh, sorry, 130,000 Alexa skills compared to about 2 million iPhone apps. So they're offering developers a larger percentage of revenue and, and doing things like these, these ad campaigns, I guess, to, uh, to encourage people to come over to the platform and start developing for it. Um, and, and, and kind of at the end of this article, it says Alexa isn't a, a major profit margin, uh, profit engine for Amazon. I, and I think we talked about that in the past. It's like they lose a ton of money on this product. It does not bring any money into their, into their ecosystem. It doesn't sell them any products. They're, they're just doing it to gather data. I mean, I can imagine they're using it to help with like voice uh, translation and that kind of thing. But I feel like they could even do that 
without without this product being in consumers' homes. But I don't know. It, it, it seems like at, at the beginning, of, when, when I kind of go back to that ad that they had that really didn't like come out to be like what the actual product intended to be. Like they were using it to play music or tell a joke and then they – they had it. They were they were they were shopping with it and that kind of thing. I think I think Amazon's always wanted you to shop with the dumb thing, but like I, I just I just when I need to shop for something on Amazon, I break out the Amazon app and I use it that way. I don't yell into the wind and hope that it gets me the right toilet paper. That's just not that's not ever gonna be a good thing. And that's the perfect example right there. Like I know they wanted you to shop with it, but I'm not gonna say order me toilet paper because you don't know what toilet paper they're going to order, you know. Yeah, I, the I scratchy want, kind. Yeah, the scratchy. I, I, I need the four-ply, super strong, you know, like whatever toilet paper, the one that's nice and soft, you know, like, but she'll order me the Amazon Basics one, and I'll, uh, you know, the, where your finger constantly breaks through that. That's the last thing I need, right? Like, I, I don't know. You know, to be fair, there's no way for um what do they call them skill developers to highlight their apps. Like they don't have like a skill store or something like that. Like nobody really looks at skills for these things. So uh, you know, it, it would be good that you know they highlight some of the more popular skills. But I just don't want them to overtake the interface. Yeah, and they they are working on like adding and giving developers more power to. In, like I was listening to um, the. IOT podcast, Stacey's podcast, when Kevin and her were talking about like the the, the developer conference and what all they they talked about, um, and and they are adding like new um, fee, new APIs for developers to take advantage of, where you can actually um, create skills around like if you're home or not that kind of thing, which would be great. I mean that's that's a massive, massive, massive uh, thing for automations to knowing whether someone's home or not, because then you can do all sorts of things, like you can do occupancy like pretend that they're home by turning on lights and TVs and that kind of stuff, music, or turning, making sure that certain lights aren't on when they're off. Like there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do when you know when someone is or is not home. But if, uh, if, if you have like a hub or a device that, that just has no input or no, no way of, of knowing that, then it, it, it's like less of a home automation system and more of just like a rules engine type thing. It's, it's not, it doesn't actually, um, I, I think that is like the bare minimum of home automation is knowing somebody's home or home or not, and then reacting based on that. Like, what levels the light should come on if somebody's home versus what levels the light should come on if they aren't home, or what lights should and should not come on. So, it, I, I think they're doing a lot of good things for developers here, but at the same time, like Gavin, you're right. Like, there's not a, a way for you to go find that that particular skill that may already do that. There may be already something that that does this in the but who who knows? How do you how do you know? You have to read some blog post somewhere. I, I don't know. I haven't used that 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 god awful Amazon Alexa app in a long time. Like it was just so bad. Is it is it any better? It's like, gotten they, better. Like like to be a, to be fair, they've put a lot of work into it. They've been making it better. Automations and stuff like um, have gotten a lot better. Um, I use it. Um, it. It's not bad. It's not my primary use. I kind of like just have my devices exported to it and I have a few routines set up in there, but it's it, it has some power to it. It's not that bad. Yeah, I know you can do a lot, quite a lot with it. It was just like always a, it was like, if this was a web view app, like just loading a web page, like it would be a million times better than just whatever this is that you've done. Like it was such- Everything that you can throw into an app. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like this would just be another like- tab on, uh, in the many 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 tabs that already exist in, in this this their interface there so it's just like at least they didn't build it into the amazon app you know, <laughs> oh, I, mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if they just merged don't them. tempt them yeah they may do that that may be the next they'll do that in the next couple of years. yeah because obviously how are you going to buy these skills like if there's a way that you can buy these skills like how are you going to do that why are you Bam. giving them the ideas stop giving them ideas Pretty soon it's going to be hard to tell what's virtual and, and what's a real good yeah. in, in the Amazon search results. Like, hmm, wait a minute. Exactly. Is this is this an NFT or toilet paper or is it actually toilet paper? Virtual toilet paper. Yeah. Uh, I just bought a picture of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's like those listings on eBay where it's like, this is just the picture of a Sonos Arc. It is not a Sonos <laughs> Arc. Right, right. Hey, the $5.99 or whatever. It's a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, um. Uh, one more story to kind of cover here. And I, I really don't have much to say about this because it's another one of those matter PR pieces that we've been kind of like skimming over uh, for the past year. It seems like it's like, well, just well, I, I will care about this one. Gotta fluff it. I guess, man, there just is so much hype around it. But one thing I, I was able to pull from this 
um, which I thought was interesting. And, and maybe it's a misconception that I have, or maybe it's a misconception that the writer of this article has. Um, but I, I think uh, Jennifer uh, Tuhoi knows what she's talking about. Tuhoi? Is that how you say her name? Tuhoi, I believe. She, she knows she knows what she's talking about. She's very, very good and a very good um, writer on these things. Uh, she says, uh, you, you'll be able to add devices to multiple platforms at once and then control them with any matter controller. Hey, that sounds good. A matter controller can be a smart display or a speaker or a voice assistant or a smartphone app. As an example, this means you'll be able to add a matter device using Alexa, and you'll also be able to control it with Apple HomeKit or Google Home. So that, that, that all, that like that one paragraph, if that is what we get out of the matter interoperability thing, I don't believe it, but if that's what we get, um, I think that's actually a really, that's a pretty good step forward, right? Cause you can just add a device in on your, the platform that you want to support or, or you have the most stuff with. And if, if you do get that Amazon echo, you, you put it in your house, you can control your other stuff with that. This is great. I think this is awesome. That is awesome. Um, but I've also seen counter to this, like uh, in another article with Samsung, where they said their devices, which will pair with the hub, won't get exposed to matter. And, you know, like we, we I, I'm still well, uh, I, I think what, they, what they're saying there is like the Samsung devices that exist today that will pair with their hub today that they're not going to update with matter can still be accessed through their Samsung hub, but they're not going to be able to like you can't come backwards through the matter devices and then get back to these devices. What you're going to have to do is say, well, Samsung's first at that point. Like yeah. you have to, you're going to have to stick with the Samsung. And I, I, that makes sense to me because they're not going to go back and update all those other devices um, to be And some, some companies have to their credit. They're, they're updating devices to be matter compatible where, where they can do this special thing. Um, but it's going to take a little bit of time, I think to, to like flush those out of the system. Uh, flush the older devices out of the system and get the newer stuff in that works with matter and has a matter logo on it. And that way going forward, we can use multiple control interfaces, I guess is kind of yeah. where we go with that verse. Yeah. Yeah. But you're still going to have that one hub to rule, rule them all. You're, you're still going to have the one, one data collector. <laughs> to, to rule. But I was, I, I was hoping one. with the smart things, they would use the smart things hub to kind of expose those devices to the matter at that point. Right. So you can still do the multi-admin, you know, but it doesn't sound like they even want to do that at, at smart things. So that, that's another thing. And in this article, I loved the, the how they talked about frustration free setup. You know, FFS, all I know is when I think of FFS, you know, it's another saying that I can't say on this show, <laughs> but I say a lot when adding devices to my hub, right? <laughs> but I, I just love that they use frustration-free setup. I'm going to laugh every time I think of that. Oh my gosh, that that is oh, the worst man. acronym. That's like a, that's like POS for point of sale. It's, every yeah. time I see POS, I'm like, that's not what that means. Yeah. Well, and I think Samsung's probably a bad. Samsung's always a bad indicator of this kind of stuff, just because Samsung always does their own thing. They find they whatever else somebody else is doing, they kind of just make their own little version, and they're like, no, we have this thing. This is what we do. And everybody else is like, well, we have you know 4K, but you have UHD or you have you have whatever you have over here. And it's always just something so annoying with Samsung that I just I wouldn't trust whatever Samsung says on anything and whatever they do do. It's just going to be their own proprietary thing. Yeah. And I, I they're a big enough company globally that they can do that. Right. Like they, they have their their tentacles into everything. And I think what, from their perspective is like, OK, Matter's not going to support the energy monitoring on this dryer thing that we're putting out in, the, in this washer dryer combo. That's going to be mm-hmm. the, you know what we're going to be putting in the in this ES show. So why are we going to promote you know, why are we going to push that forward when we can just integrate it with the device and the company that we already have? We can say, okay, it works with smart things and smart things will work with matter too. Like, so I, I don't know from, from that standpoint, it seems like it's, it's good for them, right? Like it, it's the, what, what's holding matter back in that case is that they don't support those, those other types of devices. Like they're not supporting washer and dryers or right out of the gate. It may come, you know, a few years later, but it, it's going to be a slow March before, uh, all those washer dryer manufacturers can agree on on how to make a smart washer dryer and what you know in hooks and variables and APIs need to be exposed from your smart washer dryer. Um, that just sounds like a nightmare. Like just just dry my just dry my clothes. That's all I want you to do. just wash them where they don't stink and dry them. That's that's all that's all I want you to do. And I want I want my stupid oven to set the freaking time in the microwave. I have the time. 
Let's, the smartest kitchen in the world would be the one that has the, the, the correct time. That, that's all. That's all. <laughs> After, the power. After the power is restored. I don't need a TV. I don't need a video camera in my oven to tell me I'm cooking fish. I don't, I don't need any of that. What I need is the time on the clock when I walk in at night and say, what time is it? To not just be blinking because the power went off three days ago. And everybody that walked by that microwave does not want to set that time. No, no, no. Because we can't figure out the key can't, presses. Can't figure it out. No, it's so confusing. Yeah. I mean, that that's FFS right there. I mean, <laughs> all right. FFS is me just trying to change my fridge to water to ice. You know, what button do I hold down? <laughs> yeah, our, our fridge has this amazing bit of uh, UX in it. Um, it's got like this little chime that goes do 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 or do do do. And then a light that says ice on, ice off, right? So turn the ice maker on. Ooh. And you would think when you press the button and it goes do-do-do, that means ice is on, right? No, that means ice is off. And the light that lights up, it lights up. You would think that means that the ice is on. No, that also means ice is off. And, and so it's just completely 180 backwards. And it's such a mind trip because the sound is not lining up with what you see and what you're doing to turn on and off the ice machine. Um, Samsung, again, Samsung. So, you know, they, they could build that into smart things. <laughs> If they wanted to, <laughs> but I don't think it would be any more useful. It would be completely backwards. See, that, that's a clear example of FFS right there. FFS, well. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I just, want, I, just want, I just want ice. I just want ice to be made in the refrigerator, and I want the clock to be set on the oven. I don't need anything else. I, I really don't need anything else. I've figured everything else out. Knives, forks, spoons. I figured all that out. It's all good. I don't need any, any more smart products in the kitchen. Smart cutting board on it? <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, uh, let's move on before I go crazy about the smart kitchen here uh, and lose my voice even more. So uh, we've, got, we've got some some new interesting products here. And I, I thought this was at first, I thought it was door locks, but it's not. It's locks, lock, like, like lock locks, like smaller locks, but it's still kind of cool. So uh, your next lock could completely powered by your phone thanks to new technology from a chip manufacturer called Infineon. Infi- Infineon, I guess that's how you say it. Uh, the company announced a, uh, it's called the NAC 1080 uh, chip, which is an all-in-one design chip that has NFC that can recognize your phone, harvest the power, and drive a smart lock. It's all kind of like, they're, they're, and there's also a 32-bit ARM Cortex-M0 CPU in there to kind of aid with security features, basically like say, okay, that phone that just tapped up against the lock is the phone that sh- it should be able to unlock. Like all the logic can be built into that. So that's pretty cool. Um all the manufacturer really has to do is add an antenna, a three volt mini motor uh, and capacitor. So that they're offering basically a package solution to make a smart lock. Now, this is like a gate lock or like a locker lock or something like that. Or like you would use at a gym or something. You walk up, you tap your phone onto it. There's no batteries inside the thing. Uh, it just it just has enough power in there from the tap on the phone and the NFC like transduction, I guess, that's going on between the NFC chip or the antenna and everything. That, that's enough to power up this little chip to say, okay, yes or no, this is the person that's supposed to be here and unlock the lock. That's really cool. Really, really cool t- cool idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I posted this in, in the group and it looks like it takes about five seconds to unlock, which I don't think is that bad. Um, and they they specifically state that it is only for padlocks, you know, the, the kind of design of that um, because it has to let go of the clasp. Um, So I don't think you're going to see this come to like a deadbolt or like a doorknob anytime soon. But it's really cool to see this kind of technology come out where you don't need a battery. And realistically, you shouldn't have to worry about it dying. Um, You know, maybe the little internals go bad or something like that, but you're not having to charge it every six months or three months or or whatever. Um, And it just works with a normal phone. There's nothing fancy you need with it. Um, And yeah, from the video, it looks like it works pretty fast within five seconds. So I'd be willing to give it a shot. Oh, this is great. Like I, I liked when I saw this, like using power from your phone. Um, that's an awesome idea. I wonder if what other devices we could do to use that. But then we just got to make sure we'll have bigger batteries in our phone, because if we're going to get more devices like this, I'm going to be draining my battery, you know, a lot. Just got to stack them with the uh, the mag back there. Yeah. I mean, the, the NFC stuff is pretty low power, like low power trends. Like it's it's there's not much power that goes back and forth. This is just like milli, milli, milliwatts that are going through like very, very small amounts of power um, just to basically fire up the little chip inside there and read it. And I, it looks like it just takes a few seconds. Yeah, that video is, is kind of neat. I'm kind of watching that the, the the looped video where it's just charges up and then it's like, OK, unlocked. Um, that's really cool. Uh, I, I, I really I really like this is a great idea. 
uh, and I'm glad that like it's nice that this is like a, a package solution. So like anybody like Master Lock or whatever could come along and release a product with this in there. And and like like the article says, they just got to supply a few other parts and pieces along with their lock, and uh, you're good to go. Like this would be great for like gems and that kind of thing. Like uh, something I would I would assume this is like an indoor technology, but maybe you could use it outdoor. I don't know. That's what I was just thinking. You know, I'm kind of in the old, I guess, mindset where I want a key backup and I don't think this is probably going to offer a key backup. Um, and I, I have two padlocks on my van right now um, that lock my uh, my ladder, ra- my ladder rack down. Um, so it'd be kind of nice to replace those with this if it was possible, um, but it would have to be wa- water resistant. Um, and I would want a key back up just in case it does die at some point. I mean, I think lock picking lawyer would probably take this apart in like less than five seconds. Like, I, I think, honestly, I think that they would, this is probably going to be one of those things where he like taps it twice and it falls apart, but we'll see. Well, and the, <laughs> and these things are never that secure. You know, you could easily cut this off with a bolt cutter or a grinder or something like that. They're not meant to keep like super, you know, thieves out, I guess. Um, they're meant to just stop people from walking up and opening your, your lock, whatever you have on it. Yep. These are the keeps honest people, honest locks, uh, of the world. So, uh, yeah, I, I, but I, I think it's cool technology. I hope we see, start seeing this cause I would, I would get one. Yeah. And think, uh, I'm trying to think of what else you could use this for where you just need a little bit of power and, you know, I can't really think of anything in the lock space, but there's a couple of things around the house that maybe you could use this for cool idea. I'll buy, I'll buy one when it comes out. Well, uh, speaking of buying things, when you also, put, I, I'm going to just assume anything that ends up with locks and and is is TJ's. It's lock week. <laughs> it's lock week here. Yeah, uh, I guess the Yale Assure Lock Two was leaked on on Lowe's website and just kind of like come and gone. It's, it looks good though. Yeah, no no official announcement about it. I haven't seen anything official about it. A couple of different websites have picked up the Lowe's link, uh, but nothing crazy. But I think it looks way nicer than the old version. Um, a little more rounded corners, a little more square body. Um, the finish is nice. The one that we they have here is like a black finish. Um, matte black, it looks like. Good update. Yeah, no, it it yeah, it, look, it looks like it has most of the same features. I get I think it's right here. It works with Vera X. Okay, well, I guess I can't have Vera. Uh works with Amazon Alexa X. I mean, that's not good. <laughs> so it's kind of weird uh, that they they have all this biometric lock app capability. But yeah, it's only this is only the Bluetooth version. So uh, that must be it. Okay. Yeah, they always have a Bluetooth version, and then you can get a little um, little plug-in module um, that plugs into it and changes it to Z-Wave or Wi-Fi or something like that. So you're probably just seeing the base model, um, and then we'll probably see the Z-Wave and Wi-Fi modules and stuff like that before long. Um, but this isn't officially announced, as far as I can tell. So. This is just a uh, a simple error on Lowe's side that they have not corrected, and we get to see it before it comes out. I have a Yale lock, and I, I really like these locks. The batteries last a long time. They work well for me. But, yeah, this is a Bluetooth version. It looks like it works with their app. You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with a Zigbee Z-Wave version that, you know, we can integrate with our hub of choice later on. Yeah, this is the this is the uh, brand I use. I always use Yale for my smart locks. I just think they look a little bit nicer. And I like the way they behave compared to like the Schlage or the Quick Set. I'm thinking, I, I think I, I'm just trying to see which one I have. It's dead over there. I've never, I haven't used it in about two years, but I think it's the Quick Set. It doesn't work anymore though. Um, but I, I, I've, I've, I've been in the market for a, a new door lock for the, the garage here, and um, I don't know. I, this, this one, this one might make the cut depending on the finishes that come with it because I, I can't use black, but maybe something else. Yeah, they usually come in like a, like a brass color and then the satin nickel silver. and silver. Yeah, yeah I have to wait and see what they come up with. One fifty nine is not a bad price though, or yeah, one sixty no. US. Yeah, it's pretty good. And in the description, it says you can add a Wi Fi module, so yeah. I would expect it's just like the old ones, and they probably even take the same module. Yep, there we go. All right, cool. We'll have to keep an eye out for that when it when it comes out. And and we we've, we've got one more. One more lock. All right. So if you ever looked at your, 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 your door, your door lock and said, Hey, that would make a great place to put a video doorbell. This thing is boring. <laughs> well, uh, the smart door lock maker Lockly has a pretty good solution here for you, uh, at $500, the Lockly vision elite. It's a camera, a doorbell and a smart lock. It's a camera, a doorbell, and a smart, it's the same thing. Are you guys getting it? 
So yeah, that was my Steve Jobs impression. All right. So it's got a, a camera and a doorbell and a smart lock, all built in one. Uh, he launched this week and is the successor to the company's Lockley Vision video smart lock. Uh, the device has a 1080p wide camera, night vision, motion sensor, integrated door sensor, which is kind of cool. It tells you the doors open or close, and an integrated solar panel to keep the thing charged. Uh, as a smart lock, the Lockley Vision Elite has a full deadbolt replacement. Uh, it's operated by a key, an app, a built-in keypad or a fingerprint sensor. It's got everything on it. The keypad has a <laughs> keypad is interesting. It has a rotating display to that will confound anyone peeking over your shoulder, including yourself, like trying to unlock your door <laughs> by memorizing what your what the locations were. Where the yeah, no, you actually have to look at this stupid thing to open your door, uh, or I guess press on the the fingerprint reader if that's working. Uh, anyway, yeah, it doesn't let people look over your, 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 your shoulder to figure out your codes because it rotates and the display changes every single time. Amazing. Uh, anyway, the video doorbell has a very small button evidently on the keypad <laughs> and it triggers the doorbell inside. There's, there's a two way audio for talking to a visitor and, uh, for any recordings are actually stored locally on the lock. So that's kind of nice. There's no, um, you know, cloud component to this. It's a local device. But it also works with Google and Amazon. It says it works on Wi-Fi, but it also requires a hub. So I guess I have to ring that bell there uh, to say it does. But $5.99 for this thing. Uh, and Eufy has a similar one out there for $3.99. So I didn't pull that up to compare it exactly. But $500, 500 bucks seems pretty good for all you get in this package here, I guess. This thing is uh, this thing's a beast. I mean, just look at it. Now, I mean, like, especially if you live in a place where they don't have a hardwired doorbell already, um, I could see this being the appeal, right? Like, I live in an apartment complex. We don't really don't have a doorbell. Um, we could replace this. We could gain the, the video doorbell and the smart lock at the same time. Um, it passes my check. It's got a physical key override. So that way, when the electronics die, you can still get in. Um I would have to see what the quality is like in person, but I'm not I'm not hating on it at all. I like it. Yeah, it's it's up there. Five hundred dollars is a lot. But if you if you don't have anything at the door already and you could just buy one device that does it all and it works great the first time, then that's worth a lot of that's worth a lot of uh, time and money saved. I like the solar panel. Yeah, I, I, I'm at odds with this because people still struggle these days with just the smart doorbell. Right. I have so many videos of people's fingers touching the camera. You know, it's not funny. Like they, I, I constantly have to go out to my front door and clean off my camera because it's got smudge marks on it, right? Um, I don't know why it's difficult, but you know, it's just a certain generation of people struggle. Looking at this lock, looking at this lock, I don't know if they'll even know what that the doorbell. That's the doorbell. Like, will they be able to figure that out? Probably not. You know, like it's gonna be. They'll just come to. The, they'll just knock. At that point, they'll look around. You'll have a video of them looking around, and then they just knock. Well, that's what everybody in my area does anyway. They don't even ring the video doorbell. They'll just knock instead yeah. or not even do anything. It's like, well, you have a video doorbell. It, it should have picked me up at least. Is is the doorbell on the side? What is the green button on the side of it? I don't know what the green button is, but the doorbell itself is the silver button because it has a little bell yeah. icon and everything. That's just a light, I think. The green is light. The, is, the, oh. uh, is the green a fingerprint sensor or something? I thought that was underneath the keypad, like where it has the little, maybe. I don't know. It's very confusing. See, the fact that we're even confused just by looking at this, you know, like how's a regular user going to be? I, I'm pretty sure that's the fingerprint sensor. Ah, uh, it must be. So you just tap your finger on. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. It doesn't look, it doesn't look completely awful, but it does look like it's a beast. It wouldn't go on my front door. Yeah, this would be good on like a garage door. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's that's. I mean, that's funny enough. That's where we have our smart lock. Just you know, that's not smart anymore because it doesn't work. But, um, like, we we don't want. We never have wanted one on the front door because. Like typically they're just too bulky and every, like some of them have come out where they're not like, they don't have the giant keypad on the outside. And it's just like the smart thing on the inside and that's it. But, um, we're, we're, we never wanted to have like anything up there that was like outside of the traditional hardware. So putting it on the garage door made, that's made the most sense, even though it's kind of like harder to get to. But if you get locked out of the house, it's one way you can get back in. It's just going to the, the smart door lock thing and pushing your code in. Yeah, and at this point in time, I'm trying to encourage my FedEx, UPS, mailman to ring the doorbell when they come and drop off a package, you know, like at this point, they're not even going to know what to do. 
Oh, mine, mine, what they do is they just stand about maybe six or seven feet away from the door and just chuck the package at the door. We'll just hear this like boom sound. And we're like, what, what is that? <laughs> and then I go and I'm like, oh, we've got a delivery. But did they just drop it that hard? And I'll go and I have a video. I'll just, I'll, I'll try and share in the hub or something uh, where, where they just, they just, they, they have a toss. Like they toss it, take the picture and, and oh, I, I did it. And they left like and my favorite ones are the ones in the rain where they're just like trying to get out of the rain. They just like chuck it at the door and take off. So. At least they're not throwing it on your roof. Yeah, that would that would be rude. That would just be rude. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all the links and topics we discussed tonight can be found on our show notes at hometech.fm slash 397. Uh, nothing in the mailbag this week, but I do have a pick of the week uh, that I would like to share with everyone um, I have, have may, may have used this as the pick of the week before, but the, the Shelly RGB W2, it's a nice little, um, RGB W, right? It could just be RGB or, or just W, I guess it could be e- any one of those things. Uh, it's a nice little, uh, PWM or just basically like lighting controller for tape lights, tape LED lights or, um, LED lights in general. I actually used it to control, uh, where are they? One of these little, like, LED fixture lights that I kind of had laying around for a while. It's just an LED light that, that you can use for anything, just white LED. Um, it, it, it does, it does, it, it runs on 12 and 24 volts. Um, it is tiny, 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 it's, it's tiny. all the Shelly devices are, uh, but it, it works really well. It's got pretty good software with it. The app is okay. Uh, and it's got a bunch of little integration pieces in it where you can use Alexa, Google home, uh, it, it, it does work with other devices out there, other smart devices. There's plenty of like Shelly drivers and that kind of thing for other products out there. So if you needed something to basically control an RGB strip or even tape lights, like you you can control four individual tape lights with this thing up to 288 watts. Crazy for this device. Um, this is the one, one to get. It's like $53 on Amazon for a two pack. We sell them at work in half for a while and I just decided to pick one up and, um, actually I had a wink, I had the wink, uh, the little wink RGB W light strip, maybe it's RGB light strip in my rack for, you know, kind of like inside so I could turn it on and see what's going on in there and then change it to nice, pretty colors. And I was getting frustrated with the wink thing because like, there's no API for it at all. Like it's just a wink silo thing. And I'm like, let me just take this apart. And so I took it apart and the wire that comes off the wink thing has like the 12 volt feed coming in and it has like the RGB and uh, RGB color. So like it was perfect. I just hooked that up to the Shelly, threw away the wink hub thing, just threw that in the trash because who cares who wants that thing. And then hooked this up and it works even better because now I can automate it. I can like, if there's something wrong with the server or something, all it takes is like a, a little call from the server to turn it red. You know, like if, if the internet goes down, I can turn my rack red. That's really cool. That's actually a cool usage for that. Uh, you can change the color of your rack based on, you know, the status of things. That's pretty cool. And if you want a Z-Wave version, I think Fabaro makes a similar looking device too. That Z-Wave that you can use. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. I, I, and I, I just, I've used them before. I've used Shelly product before uh, to automate some like dumb closet lights and lights that I, I could only switch to the fixture. Uh, what's nice about this one, there's a little like, there's a way that you can actually hook a dimmer up to this and dim like a full white strip lights up and down if you wanted to. Um, I didn't do that, uh, but you can hook a, a normal, like I have hooked up normal switches to these to where like you can just hook a, a regular toggle switch that you have in your light, your house, you know, $1 toggle switch, put this up in the fixture and uh, it, it basically turns it into an automated fixture at that point. Now, you know, whether, whether you like that your light may turn off when the toggle switch is up, uh, that, that, that because of some automation that happened, that may, that may annoy people, <laughs> certain people in my house <laughs> who don't like it when that happens. But, uh, but you know, it, it doesn't bother me too much that the light gets turned off if it's not being used. So, um, I, I do, I do like these products and this one is just bang for the buck, probably one of the better, um, RGB controllers out there, um, because it does, it works actually really works well and, and does so much for, for 288 Watts. That's, that's quite a bit. doesn't look like it should do 288 of anything the size of this thing haven't haven't got to play with that yet so i don't have rgb light oh do i have a i think i do 
Yeah, I thought about adding some, but I want I want the individually addressable ones. That way I can Pixels, tell yeah. each one. Yeah, those ones are sweet, but I haven't like decided to jump into that yet. I have a strip downstairs with no power supply, but it just gets so confusing. What do I need? What do I gotta get? Uh this is easy though. But if it's not a pixel strip, you can use one of these. Like if it's just a regular light thing, you can you can use one of these things and you it's not very hard. You hook up the RGB wires to the red, green, and blue, and there's there's a there's a positive cable uh, for power that hooks to the controller and the light strip, and then a ground wire that goes to the power supply. So I'm gonna it, consult it, you later. Yeah, yeah, give me a call. We we sell these at work, so it's it's kind of like one of those things with like I've been looking at it for a while, and I was like, well, I was ordering something anyway. I was like, I'll order this too. Just throw throw me a two pack in and see what we can do there. And anyway. For 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 fifty bucks or whatever this thing is, it wasn't a bad deal, and I'm happy. Yeah, I got it now. Like it works way better than I expected. <laughs> so, way better than that wink thing ever did. Well, yeah, the wink just turned on, and then every time I open the app, it's like, hey, you got to update this thing. And I'm like, I haven't used it. Why am I updating? I want it? to. So I uh, I pulled that out and uh, took it apart, and then I was like, let's see what let's see what the Shelly can do. And uh, the wink wink actually had a really good like little wires that were plugged into that were perfect. I didn't. Didn't have to do anything. Just tore it apart, uh, desoldered them, and it's like they up. knew you were going to take it apart. They, they knew it. that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's too good. Well, if you have any feedback, uh, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for a show, give us a shout. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can visit hometech.fm/feedback and fill out the online form. All right, guys, that wraps up another week before my voice goes out. Projects updates. Gavin, is the rack in yet? How much have you spent so far? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want the wife. She's in, uh, she's probably listening right now. So uh, I can't say how much I've spent. But, you know, like I was upset when somebody in the hub this week mentioned that their project was to actually set up their hub, their rack. <laughs> and I was so upset that they had a rack sitting there. You know, they were going to have all the fun that that encouraged me to go buy mine. So it's on order. Should be here tomorrow or before this episode actually airs um i should i should have it in i went with sys racks it's just an open frame rack you know they're based out of quebec i believe and uh so far customer service has been great i ordered a few accessories with them but i have a feeling i'm gonna have to order a few more things once it comes in but i'm excited finally cleaning up my mess very cool very cool um I, I, tj you were you were replacing your van lock so it sounds like you're having fun yeah i'm getting a remote start and uh, mainly a keyless entry system installed in uh this week um but for some reason my rear cargo door is not working with the, the electrical switch so i've been troubleshooting that while i've uh, been at home sick this week so yeah see you're you're like doubly productive now that covid's it that's so. right yeah <laughs> just just don't let me around people and i i can work all kinds <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, the people slow a, everything down. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I have finally upgraded my server, so you guys will be happy to know that I'm actually using modern technology. <laughs> oh, my gosh. About time. Nothing off a of government auction, huh? Awesome. Finally. <laughs> no, no. I actually left that in the rack. I don't know if I'm going to toss it out just yet, but um, there were two of them sitting on the floor here, and we did some cleaning up this weekend. And uh, as part of that, I was like, let me just toss these outside, and, and I'll I'll... I'll them back in if i want them and then it like poured down rain for like three hours straight and i'm like oh those are, those are still outside and so i just i hauled them down to the street and they disappeared so i don't i don't know who got them but um yeah this one this one may f have the same fate and i'll just have to lesson learned with the government auction technology from 2011 is not all that great compared to uh this beast which is which is running at two percent cpu right now i was gonna say you got and, the giant i9 processor yes I don't even know what to do with it, honestly. Don't I, even I, don't even have the correct power supply for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how do you hook this up? This doesn't make any sense. Why are there three connectors instead of two? This is not what the directions say. So yeah, I, that was a that was a confusing little bit there. But yeah, um, not not a fan of PC builds. Uh, oh, they're easy. Yeah, my 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 the biggest the biggest issue I have is with all the extra like I thought I was going to be smart and I'm like I'm going to hide these little fan wires and I'm just going to like tuck them under the motherboard and push them around on the sides and like I I got all past that and I'm like the power cables. I forgot about the power cables. And I start working on the power cables and it's like it's like just a glob of uh, like no matter what I try to do, velcro, zip tie, it's just a glob of wires. I want to get like the little pin 
like the pin injector and just take apart their little module things and put little put the new pins inside. I I, I want to make the the cables to the right length. It's just driving me nuts. There's like. 20 extra feet of cable in there that doesn't need to be in there it's a it's a server just close it <sighs> don't even look at it it'll be all right that's what you know as long as you don't see it don't let it bother you that's my like that's you, you don't look behind any tv in my house it, it'll give anybody anxiety just you know just look at the tv at certain angles from the front and be happy that you don't see any wires yeah see the the desktop computers they get cleaned up they have a little glass panel you can see the wires and they're all nice and neat the server though it's just a hodgepodge it just all goes together as long as nothing's getting caught in fans i don't really care yeah yeah there's no, there's no clicky sounds from, from wires hitting the fans so i guess oh you're good then yeah <laughs> why worry about it well, why worry yeah yeah that, that, it was an adventure trying to find the right fans for this thing because uh i guess the the case i have is for are you high and i i was shocked that like how tall some of the um cooling fan things towers i guess they call them that go on these uh, chips. cpu cpu coolers yeah they're just you get an aftermarket one they're ridiculously tall like they're just yeah. ginormous yeah um, i had to, i had to buy a low profile one after i accidentally bought like one that was way too tall yeah so i'm in the same boat i've got to re- well i was going to return i actually bought one of those and then i was like well i'll just get this water cooler thing because that'll definitely fit and then i measured it and i looked at the instructions and it said okay this it's like 280 maximum and this thing is two or 240 maximum no 280 maximum this is 240 and i got it and the thing is like 320 like 320 long so like it it was just an amazon review thing that went so this delayed me from getting the server up and going i guess is what i'm trying to say and for like all weekend i finally got it up late last night um plugged it in and guess what gavin and raid two thumbs up on that like I, that i know holy cow i was expecting like just errors and blue screens of deaths or whatever. No, the thing just cranks up. It's like, Hey, I'm here. I'm going to start working now. I'm like, Oh, okay. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, mo- Moving unraid from one system. to Another is very easy. I've done it no- numerous times upgrading my computers. Just, you just pull out the USB. You just move the drives over and boot it back up and it finds everything for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions out there, but unraid is once you get used to it and you get to know it, it's a great product. Did a great, they did a great job with that. Like I was, I was like, I had a little problem with booting into the USB thing because I guess there's like all this secure boot stuff. And I, I don't know. I, I think I finally figured out it was a motherboard issue and, and you had, it doesn't, you can't do the secure. You have to, you can't turn off secure boot without adding a video, an external video card, whatever. Um, so I did that and I was able to turn on the unsecure boot stuff or I don't know what it is. Anyway, it works now. It doesn't matter. It can be a secure. It's going to be on my rack. I don't care. It's secure now. And it, it'll, it'll be fine. So I love your in-depth technical explanation there. You know, like, you know what? I have a Mac and I just plug two cords into it and it <laughs> works. <laughs> so can we upgrade that? So <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> it's the stupid things, you know, almost as old as that server in there. Um, eh, anyway, this has been fun. Uh, it, it's doing all the stuff I, I wanted it to do before. And um, eh, it, it wasn't like it, it wasn't like soul crushingly expensive. It wasn't Mac expensive. I guess I will say that I didn't have to buy a Mac M2, whatever Mac mini thing to studio. Mac studio. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to buy one of those. So um, and, and even then, I think that would have not probably done what I wanted to do the way this is doing it. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this. I'm going to be tinkering around with some other stuff. Uh, and, and uh, like virtual machines and all that fun stuff in the future. But I don't know, this, this is, this is doing what I wanted to do now and it's kind of just cruising along. So I'm happy. And sometimes when, when, with things like this, you just have to spend the money to get some, you know, a, a good system so that it's not frustration, you know, cause when you try to cheap out and get all the equipment off of government <laughs> websites, you know, you spend months of frustration. You should have done this a long time ago. Preach again. Preach some it. of us have to learn the hard way i don't know i all in all that was a good experience because i got to play around <laughs> with the server stuff but also i have like the 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 two the two things i was able to sell on ebay basically paid for that like didn't pay for my time sure. to drive up there and back and then like i got a 48 port poe switch out of it which is you know probably a three or four hundred dollar switch right now um it's still under warranty somehow i don't know um and then i got like 20 servers that i ended up throwing in the trash so um glad the, i'm glad somebody takes them i don't know who takes them 
and I got the entertainment out of it. So I thought it was definitely worth it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, this thing, this thing should bring uh, more entertainment as well. So I'm, I'm happy I've got this thing going and hopefully uh, right now it's doing some transcoding work for me. So I'm trying to save some memory uh, on the NAS drive over there. Although I, I haven't even started using the new one. So we'll see. I, I've got all sorts of stuff, new stuff to tinker around with now. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Ty is saying Unraid is a great way to learn VM, VMware. It, it doesn't run VMware. It runs um, uh, KVM. KVM. But virtual machines, uh, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's a great way to learn um, virtualization and work with that. Um, I run a couple of v- virtual machines on my Unraid, and, you know, it, it's fun to play with. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, it, it, this is just a toy. And when I, when I have free time, <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. I will, I will get to that after this last week of, of having like three unproductive days and, and, and Monday and Tuesday just being a wash this week. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much free time I'm ever going to have in the future anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> You'll anyway, find free time. Yeah, one of these days, one of these days. Well, all right, guys, uh, I think that wraps up the show this week. Uh, th- thanks for for. We're helping me through this uh, this time with my, my voice here, so I appreciate it. Uh, but we do want to give uh, everyone a big thank you uh, to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our Patreon page. If you don't know about the Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat hub where you can rage with Gavin on people who have better racks <laughs> <laughs> you know i was feeling guilty about making you read this section with your voice and all but then you said that not so now. i'm not so guilty anymore not i don't now. feel so bad not now but I, I will say uh watching owen's uh theater build that's going on uh, in there awesome yeah, that's awesome. been good <laughs> wow that's really cool i yeah, the cool part is you never know when you see like a nice setup you never know what's behind it all Right. But watching him build it out like that, you can see the different layers and what's actually behind that wall. And that's really cool to see. Yep. 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 And there's so much knowledge and expertise that goes into what every little thing and detail in there that he's doing. So, um, yeah, it's really, really, really cool to see him do that. So uh, if you join us in the hub there, you join, join us. Uh, you, you can see that kind of he's been posted most every day now, even though it's like 5000 degrees uh, Celsius over there. They're still, they're still working, man. They're still doing Burning it. Burning so. up. Yep, yep, yep. Well, if you want to help out the show but can't f- support financially, we just appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or positive rating in the podcast app of your choice. That wraps another week here on Home Tech. From everyone here, have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Take care. You're not just going to cough into the microphone? No. <laughs> I figured hey, I'd leave that for you. <laughs> <laughs> and there he goes. He's about to die every other every other sentence. You should order some medication off your Amazon Prime subscription. I mean, you gotta get use out of that much money you're spending on it. I don't. I don't trust their their medication Hell on Amazon. No. So. <laughs> I don't trust their food, medicine, high end electronics. No. See, you guys have more stuff you can even order there too, and you pay more. This is crazy. Stop rubbing it in, Gavin. Jeez.